So welcome everybody to tonight's uh, Novak Solar Eclipse SIG meeting. Um, we have a sort of easy schedule, I think, tonight. But the main thing is that we have uh, have an, as an invited speaker, Matt Penn. Uh, let me start sharing my screen and start showing my boring slides. And, um, and then we'll go into Matt's uh, presentation. So this is the May 9th meeting. And here's what we have today. I don't think I really have any announcements and I'm gonna hear from, from Matt. Uh, and then later on, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the progress we're making on the uh, solar eclipse viewing glasses distribution. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how to plan for a hands-on session of the, of the SIG group. So we can get together in person and uh, compare setups, both people with uh, experience and, and the newbies and then uh, talk about some future meetings. So with that, I think I'm gonna go right into introducing Matt Penn. Uh, this is what I was able to pull up about him from his, uh, his websites. He has uh, extensive experience working at solar observatories, including National Solar Observatory, um, which is, I guess, the, was that the site in uh, in New Mexico? Um, yeah, uh, uh, <clears throat> New Mexico and uh, and Kitt Peak here in Tucson. And Kitt Peak, yeah, and um, a lot of research and retired. Is now working as an adjunct professor at uh, Southern Illinois University, which is conveniently located to be the intersection of both the 17, 2017 eclipse and the twenty twenty four eclipse. So. Uh, SIU apparently has uh, has gone into this quite uh, emphatically, and uh, he assists in their eclipse planning there. So please welcome Matt Penn. All right. So I'd like to talk about um, our project for the 2024 eclipse called the Dynamic Eclipse Broadcast Initiative. And I see now that I've left Dan's name off of the list. I'm so sorry. I'll have to keep you in the and many more category. But for about two years now, a group of us, uh, including others, um, have been working towards uh, getting a program together for the 2024 eclipse. Um, and that's the topic I'll, I'll discuss today. Um, obviously, I'm Matt Penn. I'm not quite retired yet. I work as a, an engineer at uh, Raytheon Technologies here in Tucson. So I've got a day job, but by night, uh, I'm an amateur astronomer. And I also do have an adjunct faculty position at, uh, at SIU Carbondale. So my email is here. If you have any questions, please send me a note. Uh, I'll flash it up at the end as well. Uh, so for the talk, I was going to just go through one quick slide with uh, my background, talk a little bit about the physics, about why we wanted to discuss, um, sorry, study solar eclipses and what we can learn from that and then discuss the 2017 experiment, what we did in a couple of slides. And then finally, um, how we're setting up our experiment for this time around for 2024 and how you guys can get involved, uh, hoping, assuming that you might be interested. And I hope that if you have any questions, just interrupt me. I've got about 30 slides or 35 slides, so uh, plenty of time for discussion. So yeah, as Alan said, I'd been working at uh, several uh, solar observatories. I started as an undergrad at, at Caltech at their Big Bear Solar Observatory uh, with Hal Zarin and Ken Liebrecht and got hooked on the sun. It's, it's an astronomy object that changes every five minutes. So I was excited. I went to Hawaii and worked at the Mies Solar Observatory where I got my um, PhD dissertation data. I was looking at sunspot oscillations, how sunspots uh, inside the dark uh, umbra how they have five minute oscillations like the rest of the sun. Um, then yeah, after that went to New Mexico to, at the National Solar Observatory and here's the Dunn Solar Telescope up in Sunspot, New Mexico. Um, spent three years as a postdoc there. Actually went to Tucson and worked at the uh, Kitt Peak Vacuum Telescope after that for three years. This, this little guy over here on the, on the left has since been demolished, unfortunately. Uh, then I jumped to Cal State Northridge. I was uh, on the faculty for three years there. Uh, and here's their San Fernando uh, Observatory. They've actually moved these telescopes onto campus now. 
and they've um, demolished their big 26 inch vacuum telescope. So I'm kind of leaving a trail of destroyed telescopes in my wake, I think, like I'm seeing now. Uh, but then finally in 2001, I uh, moved to Tucson and I was in charge of the McMath Pierce solar facility here at, at Kitt Peak. Uh, it's a 1.6 meter, was the largest solar telescope on the planet um, and was there uh, through 2018 when I um, left the NSO and, and joined Raytheon here in, in town. Uh, but my favorite project, I think, in, in the entire span has been the, uh, the Citizen Kate experiment. So this was our project for the 2017 eclipse. And it kind of started when I was thinking, where would I want to go to see the eclipse? And I selfishly thought that I'd want to go everywhere. So our, our slogan here is 2,500 miles, 60 telescopes, and 90 minutes of totality. And the idea, as I'll discuss in a few slides, is that we had a network of telescopes across the path. <clears throat> and as one telescope, um, as the eclipse ended at one telescope, it started at the next one. And so we were able to image the solar corona continuously uh, during the 90 minute transit time uh, that the shadow crossed the country. Um, this was a successful um, experiment and, and Congress got excited about it and invited us to testify at uh, some of their subcommittee meetings in DC. And um, you know we produce science and public outreach and education, so it was a win-win um, for a lot of a lot of groups. So for 2024, um, my former employer owns the uh, the name Citizen Kate, so we're calling this the Dynamic Eclipse Broadcast Initiative. Um, you can guess the name of my daughter from the Citizen Kate experiment and uh, the Deb Initiative. If you think about that, you can guess the name of my wife there. So. Uh, trying to keep the family happy. Anyway, that's who I am. So what's what's the big deal about eclipses, right? Um, we have telescopes uh, on the ground that study the corona. They're the called coronagraphs. Um, and I've used several of them. And in the simplest terms, you can think of a coronagraph as, as doing this, you know, you're sticking your thumb up and blocking out a light bulb across your living room. And this shows you what coronagraphs suffer from. So if you do this, uh, hopefully your room is not as dusty as this picture, but you'll be able to see specks of dust floating through the air between you and the light bulb. And of course, what's happening is light is getting scattered off of those dust particles and entering your, your field of view. With ground-based coronagraphs, the same thing happens. Um, light is scattered off of dust particles or aerosols or even um, molecules in the atmosphere of the earth. And that light enters the telescope and it degrades your image of the solar corona, the atmosphere of the sun. During a solar eclipse, of course, the moon um, is a really big thumb. It blocks out a big shadow uh, on the ground. <clears throat> and so a lot of the atmosphere um, is also blocked and shaded. So the scattering <clears throat> is reduced by about a factor of a thousand. And we're able to see those faint structures in the corona, which are about a million times fainter than the disk of the sun um, with much better resolution and much greater signal to noise. So we like to study eclipses to get a better image, to be able to image the corona better than with ground-based coronagraphs. But you know, NASA also studies the corona from space. <clears throat> so what is the big deal about a solar eclipse from the ground? Well, it turns out there's a little gap in some of the NASA measurements. And I've exaggerated it a little bit here, but um, what we can do is use um, emission lines from hot gas, hot plasma, uh, on the solar surface and measure those emissions in the atmosphere and the corona of the sun out to about, about 1.3 solar radii or 1.2 solar radii, um, but mostly on the disk and a little bit above the disk. Um, but these are confined to specific temperatures of gas. So really hot gas or really cold gas, or if you add up a bunch of different filter images, maybe you can see a lot of the plasma, but you never get all of it. <clears throat> Um, at higher heights, NASA has a couple of missions or instruments. One is called LASCO C2 that doesn't depend on spectral lines. It just looks at white light, a continuum. And here we're seeing all of the plasma at all the temperatures in the solar corona. But the LASCO C2 uh, instrument doesn't block down to the limb of the sun. It only goes up to about 2.3 solar radii or 2.2. So there's a gap between the area that we can study near the solar surface and the solar corona. 
And during an eclipse, um, here's an image from our 2016 uh, practice run. We can fill in that gap and look at the plasma in white light, looking at all of the temperatures of the gas in the corona um, in the same way that the LASCO instrument sees the sun. So that's the special thing about a, a solar eclipse. The, the eclipse opens up a window that allows us to make measurements in this region that's normally <clears throat> really difficult to observe. Um, so why do we want to study this region? Well, um, I'm sure you're all aware of uh, solar storms and the solar wind where particles are moving out from the surface of the sun through the corona and spread through the entire solar system. When we measure those particles or those storms in the LASCO C2 field of view, they're moving at a constant velocity. So the speed you know, at the inner radii and the speed at the outer radii are, are mostly constant. So 200 kilometers per second, sometimes 800 kilometers per second, really fast, but constant speed. When we look at the disk of the sun or really close to the, the solar surface, um, the velocity or the speed is zero. So the material accelerates from the surface out to this region where it's constant velocity in this gap. And that's what we want to really understand. So if you think about it, what we're looking at is sort of the on-ramp to the solar wind. So if you think about the solar wind as a freeway where all the particles or all the cars are moving at 75 miles an hour, um, what we really want to measure is how those particles accelerate. So if you're on the top of an on-ramp, you're going at zero miles per hour, you need to accelerate up to match the speed of the, of the traffic. And how you do that um, tells, tells us a lot about the physics. So if, if you've got an electric vehicle, right, you're going to be accelerating in, I don't know, two seconds or something, um, something very fast. Whereas if you got a really heavy uh, tractor trailer, um, it's going to take you 30 seconds to get up to 75 miles per hour. So by understanding how that acceleration happens, we can learn a lot about the physics of what's going on with the, uh, the solar wind. Okay, so that's kind of the summary of, of the scientific driver for, for our 2017 experiment and also our 2024 experiment. Um, now, the problem is that <clears throat> from any one site, you can get, well, in extreme cases, up to seven minutes of totality to view these, these particles and these structures moving. Um, in 2017, it was two minutes, and in 2024, it'll only be four minutes. That doesn't give us a lot of time to measure transverse motions. So the idea is that we wanted to extend that by having a network of sites. And so in 17, we had a network of actually 70 telescopes across the country. And like I said, it was a little relay race. As one telescope became, um, as the eclipse ended at one telescope, it started at the next telescope, and so on. Um, you can see the weather was pretty good on that day. There's some clouds um, plaguing people in Illinois and some in the West a little bit. <clears throat> but other than that, we got data from about 50 sites that we can make into a movie. And that gives us a whole baseline of 90 minutes of time to look at the motion of the gas. Um, so I don't have a movie sequence to show you because um, it's big. Here's the web page where you can download the the JPEG movie that we've made. Um, you can also download some of the reduced uh, data. Um, we've got 50 uh, FITS files, which are summed images from each of our sites. Or you can actually, if you want, look at the raw data. We've got one point, about 1 1.2 terabytes of raw data if you're ambitious. But I, I would encourage you to visit this website and take a look at our movie. You can see uh, many things. Um, here we've, we've um, spatially enhanced the corona. And uh, we've used um, high dynamic range image reconstruction. So we took a sequence of exposures from 0.4 milliseconds up to one second of time in logarithmic steps and used those to produce an HDR image. And then we filtered it spatially to bring out the structure. So in the movie, you can actually see some stars. There are two stars that move um, behind the corona. Well, actually, as the sun is moving against the stars. Um, you can see a, a polar plume that seems to um, leave the sun at a high velocity in the south and some smaller features near the limbs of the sun that seem to be ejection events. But the main thing that we see is that there was a coronal mass ejection about two hours before the eclipse. And we still see plasma 
leaving the sun in, in this area, the southeast limb. And so this is where we, we focused our studies for the science for 2017. And here um, <clears throat> we're able to publish a paper with uh, 286 co-authors and me. Um, all of our site volunteers are, are co-authors. Um, where we're measuring the outward velocity of of these plasma, of these events, of, of these uh, particles. Uh, they're not really particles, of these blobs, let me call them blobs. Um, so LASCO saw that uh, CME traveling at about 250 kilometers per second in its field of view. And in this case, I have it from three solar radii up. <clears throat> but again, it was constant velocity, constant outward speed. And the dots represent our measurements. Uh, across 90 minutes of time with error bars indicating our ability to measure the, the outflow. So, um, you know, it's like all science, there's no real easy answer. Um, we did some, some fitting. If you fit a constant acceleration to the, you know, best fit, um, the, the gas might be moving out at, or be accelerating outward at 15 meters per second squared, but you know, there are several points that don't fit that dashed line very well or a dotted line. So that doesn't describe it very well. Even a linear fit is even worse. It doesn't describe it and there's no real physical explanation for anything like that. So although we have, you know, a rough idea of the acceleration, it's way more complicated than that. And so, you know, it's good science. It opened up a lot more questions. Um, there was no clear answer. This is, again, the first white light study that's been done. Um, there are two other studies using um, lines of different temperatures that came out with accelerations close to 15. Um, but uh, ours really measures all the plasma. There's no confusion about temperature evolution. OK, so how did we, um, or maybe I should stop and see if there are any questions about the science uh, aspects. Was was LASCO actually contemporaneous? Did it really uh, observe at the same time and the yeah. same and the same cross section? Yes, and again, it, you know, it was higher up. Oops, I'm sorry, going the wrong way. It was higher up in this um, outer region of the corona. Um, I have not yet combined our movie with the LASCO movie, but that's that's a possibility. Okay, no other questions. I'll go into more of the program then. So in 17, this was our sort of timeline. We practiced on two solar eclipses, uh, one in the Faroe Islands and then one in Indonesia before our uh, 2017 eclipse. And <clears throat> because I was in the field as a solar physicist at the time, we were able to raise about... Um, $900,000, I think, for the whole project. Um, so we were able to send uh, four groups of students to Indonesia. So that was that was quite a satisfying um, uh, event. But in 2015, our first volunteer, Fred Isbener, um, who was at Carbondale, he's retired from Carbondale, was telling us that he was going just on a vacation to the Faroe Islands to see the eclipse. So we asked him if we could send him two boxes of equipment, and if you would set it up and try to take some images. Um, Fred had never um, been an astro imager, so uh, Bob Bear trained him at uh, Carbondale during the winter, uh, which was rough. But um, he, he got the equipment. Uh, the day of the eclipse was just awful weather, raining before the eclipse and partly cloudy during. Um, but he managed to get um, some images of totality the software is terrible. That was my fault. I accept responsibility. The camera was not good, but um, this is sort of our proof of concept that we were able to take somebody who had had no experience in astro imaging and get them trained up to be able to take images during the high pressure um, solar eclipse uh, event. So then, you know, <clears throat> we decided, well, why don't we try a, a network? And so in 2016, we set up a a network with four uh, academic partners, Carbondale, 
uh, Wyoming, Western Kentucky, and South Carolina State. Um, we had a faculty and student uh, pair go to uh, four different locations in Indonesia. And uh, unfortunately, the Indonesia weather did not cooperate. So we got data from one site. Um, and here is a highly filtered, enhanced version of the data uh, showing streamers. Um, but basically, it provided a, a verification that the equipment that we had planned looked like it was going to work. And we just needed to have better weather, and uh, we could build on our training. So um, our next, obviously, step was to set up a network across the US. And how we divided it up at that point was to take the states, which had um, totality, and um, to um, get a volunteer state coordinator, somebody in that state who would decide on the final locations for the observing sites, um, work with the volunteers at each of those sites to make sure that they had uh, a contact and answer their questions or pass their questions to the, the core group. Um, and all of these people themselves also took data during the eclipse as well. So for instance, here's uh, Mike Connolly um, from Rose City Astronomers uh, in Salem, um, taking some imaging uh, images during totality. Um, and there's quite a crowd there as well. Uh, we had good weather and again, most of the country. So luckily um, we had some great data, but this is kind of where we're at now. I'll, we're trying to establish regional coordinators for the 2024 event. Um, and then sort of the people who actually did the work were our site volunteers and um, we had quite a large group. So 27 different universities uh, contributed teams and 22 different high schools contributed teams. Um, some museums and informal science education groups as well. And then a couple of national labs uh, contributed volunteers. So these are people who, you know, did the work um, and, and actually got the data. Now for the 17 project, we were able to purchase equipment for everybody and provide them with the equipment and training. But the people who were not in the path of totality, um, they needed to take care of their own travel uh, to, to the path. Uh, as you can see, many of these people were in the path of totality already, um, but some had to travel and, and they covered that themselves. So after we had the uh, site volunteer list figured out and um, all of the sites determined, we held training workshops in each state where we distributed the equipment to the site volunteers. They came to a central location for about a day and a half or two days. And um, we trained them on an observing procedure. We had a, a MATLAB script that controlled the camera. The telescope mount was completely manual uh, just with an RA tracking. So it was rather primitive, um, but our uh, procedure uh, to collect calibration data and to align and focus it took about an hour before totality. And then we had a totality script that was mostly automated. So people would push a button and the script would run through a sequence of, of exposures uh, while they could enjoy the eclipse themselves. They wouldn't have to stare at a screen <clears throat> during totality. Um, so during these training workshops, you know, we had a variety of conditions in Wyoming, there was snow on the ground and in Tucson, it was 105 in the shade. So it proved to served as some survivability testing for our equipment as well. Um, but this was about three months prior to the eclipse. And then after these workshops, people went back to their home institutions or sometimes their homes and participated in practice runs. So we would have a weekend um, joint practice run where people would take data uh, upload it to um, their state coordinators and they would give them feedback, like tweak your exposure level or your camera's rotated the wrong way or give them feedback. And um, we got better. We can see focus improved and centering improved during those four practice uh, runs. <clears throat> so then finally, on the day of the eclipse, you know, we had our sites across the country <clears throat> with a variety of, of situations, right? Mountains in Oregon and then 
uh, just farmer's fields in Nebraska, we had three or four um, stadium sites where the students involved were, you know, in the middle of like 10,000 cheering fans. So how's that for pressure? Um, and then of course in South Carolina, some, some out of the way sites as well. So quite the variety and uh, there were 117 students from graduate students uh, down to an eighth grader. An eighth grader was part of a three person team. Um, and then finally, um, in terms of follow-up, we've done several projects um, with them. One of the, I think the most interesting is uh, Mike Connolly from Oregon uh, observed an exoplanet transit with his um, Eclipse telescope. It's an 80 millimeter refractor. And uh, we had a, a point gray, which is flare now, a flare camera. Um, so it's a little noisy, but with a lot of averaging, um, you got some great data and it's published in uh, Rob Zellum's paper <clears throat> in 2020. Zach Stockbridge uh, organized uh, uh, several sites um, of Kate, previous Kate volunteers for the transit of Mercury. And he was able to measure the astronomical unit um, using the baseline between the sites, um, published it in the reflector, astronomical league reflector. Uh, Jennifer Burial and her student Tilaf published a paper using data from three sites to measure the coronal uh, flattening, the uh, ellipticity, if you will, of the coronal uh, structures during the eclipse. And then lots of students have entered science fair um, projects. Um, I was happy to have three or four of them win prizes here at our Arizona SARSF science fair. Um, so uh, our follow-up science was not maybe as, as um, effective as, as we were hoping to, uh, that it would be, but uh, we had some success even after the eclipse, uh, keeping people engaged. Okay, so that's the uh, summary of the 17 experiment. Um, any questions about that? Did everyone use exactly the same setup? Yes. So we had um, 80 millimeter uh, refractor, this uh, FLIR camera, uh, MATLAB script, and uh, a uh, Celestron um, CG3 uh, mount. So, so then you could process everything the same yeah. way. Also. Yeah, and even though these were identical, identical telescopes, we still had uh, stretching involved. So at the, at the level of like 0.6% or 0.8%, we had to de-stretch some of the images because the, the you know, tolerance on the objective lens, there's only one lens in here and the tolerance on that, you know, it's just under a percent. Um, so I'll show you some images where we actually have very different focal lengths that we can do now, but we're hoping for 2024 again to to standardize the optical path, same telescope, same detector. Okay, let me jump into our plans for 24 now. So um, after after getting the paper published and having a beer, we had a meeting and figured out what the heck we wanted to improve. And one of my um, main topics was that uh, in 17, I was hoping to get a movie out that night of the of the solar corona. Because as you know, the, the interest gradually builds like during the week before the eclipse. And then the day after the eclipse, nobody remembers that there was an eclipse, right? So you've got a really small window there to, to get some effective um, astronomy education. So that's the focus of 2024 is to provide a broadcast. <clears throat> and that's why we're calling it the Dynamic Eclipse Broadcast Initiative. We'd like to do a real time or maybe a one minute delay, something close to real time uh, broadcast on, on the internet. We'd like to have cheaper equipment. Um, I'll show you some experiments that we've done with Raspberry Pi cameras, but since that time, Raspberry Pis have gone extinct. It's nearly impossible to buy any. So we've moved away from those. Um, our current equipment list is about a factor two cheaper than 17. I was hoping for a factor of four, but uh, people like Raspberry Pis and I can't buy any anywhere. Um, in 17, we had only people in the path of totality, but this time we'd like to include uh, people from outside of the path. So 
um, people seeing the partial eclipse can can participate as well. And um, to follow up with nighttime science, um, the mount turned out to be the weak point. And so we're uh, getting a different type of mount, a go-to mount that'll help uh, ease that. Here's our timeline, a um, couple of lunar eclipses and then a couple of total eclipses. The annular is only six months before the total. So it's not really a valid time to practice or to try to change anything between these two. It's a pretty tight time frame. So it'll be a good, a good practice run and maybe we can tweak some training, but we're not gonna change the equipment or anything major between um, those two. So let me talk a little bit about the lunar eclipses and the solar, and then our uh, end up with our plans. So back when we were using Raspberry Pi uh, cameras <clears throat> in uh, uh, November 21, we had two sites that were able to see the, the lunar eclipse. This is almost a total lunar eclipse. It was 98%, so there's a little bit of bright moon still visible. But here are the background stars from uh, Tehachapi, California, and some Cirrus. And then in Greenville, Texas, uh, at the same time, there's the moon. And so obviously you can see that the parallax between those two sites lets the moon move back and forth. And if you put them together um, and take a look at this later with 3D glasses, there's a 3D effect. Um, I think the baseline is a little bit too big for my eyes to comfortably view. So we really wanted sites that may be 500 miles apart instead of 1,000. Uh, but uh, we're able to see that the, the moon is in front of the stars um, if you look at this with uh, 3D glasses. We're also able to um, you know, log on to Discord server and um, do sort of a real-time event, at least with the core team during this um, eclipse, lunar eclipse. In uh, May of 22, so a year ago, we um, made a movie of the lunar eclipse. And here again is an HDR image of the stars in the background. Um, if you go to this YouTube uh, link, you'll see the moon moving uh, against the background stars. Um, and what what this um, at least seemed to show to me was that there seemed to be structure in the, in the Earth's shadow on the moon. It was a little hard to tell because obviously the moon has structure as well. But it looked like there are darker and brighter parts to the shadow during the moon's transit through the umbral shadow. So that's something that we focused on for the uh, the most recent eclipse, the uh, November 8th eclipse. Here again is an HDR image. And this is now with our, um, our uh, ASI 178 um, CMOS cameras, the ones, ones that we're using for this, uh, for this project now. So you can see actually some very faint stars at the limb of the moon and a sort of really loose star cluster up here. So what I tried is to remove the lunar structures with a pre-eclipse um, image and then combine a bunch of HDR images taken during the one hour of eclipse. And so um, and then I added false color uh, to make it look fancier, I guess. But if you will, this is a, a, an image of the Earth's shadow um, during the eclipse as revealed by the, the moon. So, you know, we've all been told that, or, or at least in my head, I have this picture that the shadows are these nice round features in the sky <clears throat> and the moon will move through them. Um, but if you look here, you can start to see some structures maybe. And then on the lower left here, I've uh, done a better job of removing the lunar structures. And you can certainly see some strange features uh, in the shadow. So after talking with Fred uh, Espinac about this, um, he reminded me that it takes an hour for the moon to move through the shadow completely. And during that time, of course, the earth is rotating. Um, the thing that makes the moon red is refraction around the limb of the earth. And during an hour's rotation, you sample many different cloud um, patterns. So it makes sense that the shadow and the details of that illumination would change. Uh, during an hour. So this may be a lot of temporal variation, uh, depending on the cloud structure at the limb uh, of the Earth. Um, but I thought it was interesting and uh, something that I think if we stick together as a team, we can look at during the next uh, lunar eclipses as well. But we had a network of three sites operating with good weather during this eclipse, um, lunar eclipse as well. And 
it was a good practice for our HDR uh, imaging setup. So for solar eclipses, we've had only you know a couple, and the first one was in Antarctica, <laughs> so a little out of the way. Uh, again, Fred Isbener was taking a vacation there, so um, we asked him to take one of our Raspberry Pi cameras at the time uh, and try to get images of the corona. Um, if you've heard stories, there are seven or eight cruise ships, and there was terrible weather. Only a few actually saw the eclipse, and Fred's ship was one of them. But at the last minute, they had to do a 180 and turn around and sail in the opposite direction. So Fred had been set up on one side of the ship, which now was the wrong side, and he had to rush over to the other side of the of the ship, and uh, he saw it, but he didn't get the the camera set up in time. So the best he could do was a partial phase um, image. Here's the cloud deck, and here's the ocean. It's all out of focus, of course. But you know, it's like a degree and a half. So it was a miracle that they actually saw the eclipse. Um, but he was not able to get uh, an image of the corona. Um, this setup was really tiny, so it fit into a Tupperware bin. Um, our current setup is a little bit bigger, but uh, this is what we're also hoping for is something that's very portable. So last month, of course, there was an eclipse in um, Australia. And uh, SIU Carbondale did a really good job of sending not only physics students, but also a study abroad group. So um, students with lots of different majors uh, traveled to Australia. <clears throat> they went up the coast of Western Australia and had several outreach events along the way um, and studied uh, many things in addition to astronomy. But we sent two of our telescopes there to practice with. Uh, Chris Mandrell had, has a nice shot of the Tarantula Nebula um, after he finally figured out how to pull our line on the South Pole. And then during the partial phase of the eclipse, we got an image uh, through our um, DEB setup. Here's the full frame, and I'll show you a, a blow up on the next page. But uh, I remember looking at this thinking, this is going to be fantastic, and uh, waiting for totality. We we're um, zooming at, the, at that time. Uh, but unfortunately, um, the, uh, a couple of things happened. One of the student volunteers who was taking the cover off kicked one of the telescopes. So Chris thought that he started the software and then went around to try to set up that other telescope, but he gave up and came back and found out that the software had crashed. Um, he made some changes about an hour before totality and didn't check them. So um, as he's trying to fix the software, the 60 second eclipse was over and we have no totality images from our Deb um, setup. So it's a disappointment and the team, as you could imagine, was, was pretty upset. Um, but they did have a couple of backup telescopes, um, not as wide of a field of view as the, uh, the Deb initiative telescopes, but we were able to make uh, an HDR image and do some spatial filtering on, on the backup telescopes. What we did here um, is to take, uh, I think, a four millisecond, 40, 400, and a one second exposure. So four different exposures, almost logarithmically spaced, and then combine them with a high dynamic range uh, image uh, software package. And so again, you can see some prominences uh, that were very bright, saturated in this case, as along with some structure, some coronal streamers. And because we're near uh, solar Maximum, there's a lot of detailed structure in the corona. Uh, it's threaded with magnetic fields. So our main goal, which was to determine that our exposure times were correct, um, is still going to take a little bit of work. We have data from this backup telescope that we can now compare with our DEB instrument um, during the next crescent moon <clears throat> and bootstrap back to um, the coronal data from the backup telescope. Okay, any questions about the sort of the prep work that we've been doing? Okay, then where are we at now? So um, <clears throat> here's our sort of tiered equipment cost layer. Like I, I said, we'd like all of our volunteers to use the same optics, um, telescope, camera, and filter system. And if you have a mount that you like and a laptop, then 
we're looking at a cost of 815 bucks or so. Um, with bulk purchasing, we're going to get this lower. Um, our normal sites, so a high school I'm working with here in Tucson um, needs all the equipment. Um, the package is about 1750. They're able, it's, it's because it's so cheap, they're able to use money from their PTA um, to fund their club to buy the equipment package. So this is much better situation than having a $4,000 set of equipment like we had in 17. People can actually afford them if, if they wanna buy them themselves. And then the system actually does some decent uh, astrophotography. You can add a, an L Extreme filter here and, and go off and do some nice um, astrophotography if, if you're a beginner. If, if you're an advanced guy, like probably most of you are, um, you know, you'll know that this would make a nice guide scope. So if you wanted to upgrade your guide scope, and take Eclipse data, um, maybe this is a route to do that. So here, here's the package. We're using um, this new Ioptron Skyhunter uh, mount, which is, you know, it's a very in inexpensive go-to mount. I've had a lot of fun with it um, in the backyard. Um, it uh, connects to CDC or planetary programs uh, very reliably. And once you, uh, once you calibrate it on targets around the sky, it, it points uh, very accurately. We're using the ASCAR uh, 180. This is a 40 millimeter telescope, um, F4.5, um, six elements. <clears throat> so it's pretty well color corrected um, across the field. Um, so that's good news. You need a couple of spacers uh, to get the, uh, the Neptune, the Player One camera uh, on it. This is the uh, IMAX 178 chip. Uh, and they've got a, a nice camera. I think it's 14 bits uh, controlling that chip. Uh, neutral density filter for uh, the partial phases. Uh, yellow number 12, because we think it helps, even though this is color corrected very well, we still think we see an improvement with a yellow filter. It doesn't cut down the flux very much. Um, and it doesn't make a difference with the mono camera really, <clears throat> but it improves the sharpness. And then, you know, uh, Example laptop is something like eight gigabytes of RAM, uh, 100 gig uh, solid state drive and uh, USB three and Wi-Fi. So stuff that's pretty basic now um, and get for less than 400 bucks on Amazon. So this will be in the, in the slides if you wanted to take a detailed look at any of these equipment. Um, when we do buy the equipment sets for um, the 60 groups, I'll talk about that later. Um, if people want to, join in on our purchase, we can probably get bulk discounts. So keep that in mind as well. Here, here's the setup. <clears throat> um, it's tiny. So I'm using a tiny micro PC. This, I mean, you know, this is a 40 millimeter telescope. So that gives you a scale. This is two inches, right? Um, a tripod can be extended, but I had it just in a low configuration. Um, it's got a nice uh, rotation feature. So hopefully we'll be able to get everyone's care, uh, camera oriented the same way. Um, and like I said, this is a very portable, lightweight, uh, go-to mount, uh, compact. And, you know, we can get some decent images. So here's here's a solar disk. Um, this is uh, probably about 100 frames out of a 500 or so uh, frame capture. Um, you know, instead of using auto stacker, which is no longer supported, I've been using something called planetary system stacker. The, uh, the author is still maintaining um, this, this set of software, um, but it does the same thing. It does a de-stretch and stacks images uh, based on quality. And then it, you can apply wavelet filters um, after the fact as well. So this is wavelet filtered as well to bring out some of the details. Um, so the solar disk, uh, you have to crop the field of view as I showed you, but you can get some good detail on the solar disk. Um, at night, um, you know, here's from my backyard last night, uh, M51, about three hours of integration uh, processed in serial uh, with a couple of uh, some very weak wavelet filtering and planetary system stacker, just a little bit to sharpen up the stars. Uh, but you can see the tidal tails in M51 and some of the nearby galaxies um, and if you're good, you can see this thing over here, which I think is a reflection. So I had the yellow filter in front of the objective. Uh, tonight, I'm going to move it around to the back of the telescope. 
Um, structurally, it makes more sense to put it in the front, but I think of getting reflections uh, when it's there. But it does some decent uh, nighttime imaging as well, uh, although I'm sure you guys uh, do much better with, with larger telescopes, of course. So um, in terms of science, we're looking at developing uh, science projects uh, now. Again, the exoplanet transit uh, project is something that uh, we're excited about. Um, <clears throat> Mike's error bar is about 30 millimags. And uh, from the 17, 2017 equipment package, uh, Jeff Weiss has looked at uh, an asteroid called uh, Cleopatra. And he gets about 30 millimags um, error bars as well. So we expect to be able to reproduce these exoplanet observations. But again, another thing is uh, asteroid light curves. <clears throat> um, Jeff took this data over the course of three or four nights to build up a nice uh, phase diagram. Uh, of course, variable stars are another obvious target for this uh, in terms of follow-up. Um, in terms of solar work, <clears throat> there are two things. One is um, you can look at P modes. So these are, these are oscillations, five-minute oscillations in the sun. And um, <clears throat> this might be a little bit uh, advanced, but uh, I've got what's called a uh, dispersion diagram. So there's spatial frequency, I'm sorry, temporal frequency on the y-axis and spatial frequency or wavelength sort of on the x-axis. And when you look at the oscillations on the surface of the sun, they fall into these particular ridges. Uh, the oscillation power falls into these ridges. And so you can see them with, with the system. So you can do, you know, helioseismology from your backyard. It's you know, not going to be like publishable quality data these days, but uh, I think it's a cool project. All right, so our current status is that we've got two um, <clears throat> grants that are supporting our equipment. Uh, one is from the NSF uh, in cooperation with a, a movie. Um, it'll fund 20 sites of equipment. These are um, dedicated towards either Girl Scouts or women in STEM. Uh, groups um, to go along with the theme of the uh, film that they're making. Uh, we've also got a NASA grant uh, from uh, Helo Physics Citizen Science that'll purchase 40 sets of equipment. And then our core team um, is a group of us who are buying these packages ourselves, or we've looked at some NASA space grant uh, funding opportunities. Um, the high school group that I'm working with has used PTA money, for instance. And so we got about 10 of those people, roughly. So right now we've got um, money in, in hand for about 70 sites um, worth of equipment. Uh, who's going to run that? Well, like I said, we got the 10 core team, roughly, people. And then I've got some email volunteers. Um, we've had some announcements in Sky and Telescope. And so we're trying to gauge exactly how motivated these people are currently. Um, so we're about halfway there, I think, in terms of the volunteers uh, that we'll, we'll need um, to actually operate these uh, equipment packages. Um, and, and currently, like I said, we need more volunteers, but also regional coordinators. If, if you're really interested in, in helping out and joining, um, and you're uh, interested in not only observing the eclipse and taking data, but helping four or five other groups do that, uh, then please let me know and we'll get you into a regional coordinator a position. And then finally, um, the federal funding we can't use to support sites in Mexico or Canada. And we've got about five right now <clears throat> that are interested. So we'll be doing some private fundraising um, to, to pay for those packages, uh, probably in June through uh, Carbondale, SIU Carbondale. Um, so just four more slides. Uh, or three or more were at the eclipse. Of course, you know, the annular eclipse in October goes from Oregon through uh, South Texas. Um, I'll be in Hobbs, New Mexico at one location. Um, we're not trying for continuous coverage. Um, we're using this as a way to test out um, systems that people, uh, early adopters are using. So we'll have sites all over the country for this. Uh, but the, the sites in the path, we'll be looking at, uh, had an idea sort of inspired by this uh, Chinese amateur's uh, image. So here's an annular eclipse from 2020. And I don't know if there's a name for this. I'm, I'm going to call it a Bailey Beatogram, where he takes exposures about two seconds apart uh, around the time of, of mid eclipse. 
And this allows you to see uh, mountains and valleys on the lunar limb, right? So this is a cool way to get the limb profile from, from one site. But if you're looking at the moon from Oregon and Texas, you're going to have a parallax effect. And so the limb that you see from those two locations will be slightly different. So if we make a movie sequence of these Bailey beatograms, um, the limb profile will change uh, from as the uh, moon moves across the country. So that's maybe not really a science topic. I mean, the lunar profile is known very accurately, but it's an interesting, I think, uh, outreach um, and education um, tool. So that's going to be the focus for the sites that are in the path of the annular eclipse uh, in October. <clears throat> for the partial um, eclipse sites, what we're hoping to do is to get them taking uh, daily solar data. So um, the good thing about these cameras is that we can get up to 30 frames a second. And that the image quality that you saw before, um, we have a possibility for detecting white light flares as we, you know, in, uh, get towards the uh, maximum of the solar cycle. We expect some very large uh, flares to occur, X-class flares, and those likely will emit continuum um, emission, so-called white light flares like Carrington saw uh, through his telescope visually. Um, these are some infrared observations from Kitt Peak, so these are at wavelengths that we can't get at. But you get the idea here is that we're going to try to use these telescopes with daily observations. <clears throat> um, if there's no flare, no energetic flare that day, you can toss the data out. Um, but if there is, then we'll save that data off and, and analyze it later. Th this is, I think, pretty well suited to places that are associated with universities or maybe people's backyards where it can be operated at a daily cadence and uh, we can maybe get some good science. The white light flares that we saw in the infrared uh, showed structure at the 10th of a second um, temporal frequency and radio observations suggest even higher frequencies. So 30 frames a second would be a new uh, look at a white light solar flare. And then for the, the main event, um, obviously the, uh, you, you know the path, it goes from Mexico across the continent uh, and then hits some of the uh, Eastern Canadian provinces. Um, we're still working on getting people along the site identified. Uh, we've got a couple of Obviously, uh, Carbondale, Illinois, a couple of Indiana sites, a lot of Texas sites, um, but we're trying to fill in the path in the next two months um, with volunteers and, and locations at least. So if you are interested, uh, and this is this is what uh, we hope to come up with, probably better, hopefully better than this on the day of the eclipse. So if you're not interested in joining the eclipse project, um, I hope that at least you look at our webpage on the day of the eclipse and um, we're hoping to have uh, movie sequences from sites that see the partial phase and also a movie sequence of the totality as well. But if you are interested in joining, um, you know, if you're really motivated, we're doing some final hard uh, software development. Um, we'd love to have people do some curriculum development for schools or, or outreach as well. Uh, we're not calling them state coordinators. This is old, I'm sorry. So if you're interested in being a regional coordinator, that would be fantastic. Or a site observer, you know, please let me know. And these are ways to get in touch with me. All right, so that's all I had. Any questions? Great, Dick. Matt, so for, for the um, regional coordinators, do those people have to be along the line of the eclipse? Um, no, and that, that's the, the plan this time around is instead of having people go to a central location for the training, we'll have um, videos. You know, we, we all know how to do things remotely these days. So the training will mostly be remote. So I'll be coordinating um, one group from Tucson, a group from New Mexico, a group from Arkansas and Texas, so kind of scattered. Um, so yeah, it, it can be done uh, from any location. It's, well, it's a matter of time. Point, I guess certainly it would help for the outreach portion to be local to one right. of those, if you're if you're coordinating for a region to basically have a chance to know the people. Yes. 
I guess the situation with this eclipse will be a lot of people traveling to, well, they're, they're relatively well occupied places, but people traveling from off the center line quite a bit. Um, a lot of Californians probably going to the Southwest and people from the mid Atlantic going to uh, Ohio, New York. Yeah, exactly. I think Texas population is probably going to double for this event. Yeah. Other people have questions? I, w I wasn't aware of what, exactly what the status was of planning and and the fact that you that you still needed help, but that's uh, that's good to know. Uh, I think I think everybody in our group is either planning or hoping to be somewhere close to the center line. We had a mix when we did an early survey of how many people had firm plans. A lot more had plans to go than plans of where to be. Well, now's the time. Uh, I must admit, I was uh, shocked at the hotel prices. Um, I'm going to go to Uvalde, Texas and work with the school district there um, and was able to find a cabin about 20 minutes away that was reasonable, still double the normal price, but some of the hotels were $900 a night, just insane. Yeah, I think in 2017, people tried for that too. And then maybe a little bit of reality came in closer to the date. I was in Idaho when people were trying to uh, sell places to park your RV for about $200 a night. And then they found out that there were a lot of people selling places to sell you to, to set your RV. And the prices dropped. 2017, I had booked, uh, we, we organized a family reunion in uh, Nashville, and uh, I had uh, booked several rooms for family members, and the, uh, the hotel that I had one of my daughters and her husband uh, booked in burned a week before the, oh, no. <laughs> so we were scrambling, and you know, she ended up, you know, they ended up sleeping on the, uh, the, the couch in, uh, in my, 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 my wife's room, but, you know. But you know, there was nothing to be found anywhere in the vicinity of Nashville any any time around the eclipse. And I had booked early enough that well, I paid a higher rate. I didn't pay the outrageous rate some people did. But yeah, you know, book early. Matt, I've seen pieces of this before, and some of you know I've, I've been slightly involved with Matt's uh, participating in some of the calls and offer the last year. And it's, as to see it evolve and progress, I've, I've got all of the equipment except for the the ASCAR. I'm, I ordered it uh, two months ago. I was actually notified by High Point Scientific today that there's been another, yet another delay, and they're telling me now that I may have it by July. So, but I got wow. everything else. So, wow. Uh, yeah, it's been. We've gone through set of, several iterations of equipment, as as you probably know. And uh, the mount, the first mount we chose was discontinued. The first telescope discontinued. Then Pi Cam or Pi computers disappeared. So hopefully, hopefully this equipment will at least stick around for another year. Yeah, I got the Sky Hunter uh, actually just last week. So I'm ah. looking forward to playing with it some over the weekend. When, uh, Matt, when do you figure you're going to um, get your attempt at a bulk purchase in for the people who, who want to join in? Yeah, we're, we're looking at July uh, timeframe to do that. Um, the, you know, those awards have been, we've got, or Bob Bear has gotten the award letters, but the funding accounts have not been set up yet. So that'll take some time. Um, so around July, we're going to order the things that may disappear, like the cameras and the ASCAR telescopes. Um, and we're hoping again to have, um, to start training around September. So have all of the sites and volunteers figured out by say the end of August. Um, and then um, we'll either drop ship them or um, mail them from Carbondale to to the volunteers. Um, having having these workshops is kind of old fashioned idea now, I guess. Um, Matt, uh, it's uh, Robert here. I'm a new member of Novak. Uh, I'm just curious: Have you done any analysis to uh, 
ascertain where the likeliest locations along the path for 2024 would be for decent viewing and decent weather. It's something I, I, I'm intending to do it. I don't know if I can get involved in your project. I'm very interested. I want to learn a little bit more about it. But I am very interested in knowing where the best place to be is. I'm curious to know what your thoughts are. Yeah, I'm, I'm not the expert on that, but there are uh, people who are fantastic uh, with those um, predictions. So the annual uh, cloud cover for that, or the average cloud cover for that day is is pretty well known. And basically the further south you go, the better. So Mexico mm -hmm. has, you know, 90% chance of clear skies. And by the time you get to Texas, it's about 50-50. And as you go up the path towards the northeast, the probability of clear skies drops. Mm -hmm. So that's that's where a lot of people are, are headed to Texas. But you know, I have to say though, uh the day of the eclipse, the weather, as long as it's not a really large weather system, if you're looking at local convection, that's that's affected by the temperatures. So for instance, in the 17 eclipse, the convection in the southeast was not as great as people were predicting. And we had clearer skies. So maybe maybe it'll be better um, than the predictions. But Alan, you must have a link to, um, gosh, I've forgotten the gentleman's name. He's a Canadian weather forecaster. Oh, uh, no, not, not Javier. Uh, yeah, Javier has a link to his- He has a link to the page. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I know he, and we have a link, we have a, a resource page for this group that uh, Robert, if you look at it, um, you'll find the link to the, to the weather forecast analysis, but it's, it's climatological. Uh, as I learned yeah. when I work on those kinds of things, climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. And then that's the same thing. Um, and Robert, you mentioned you were new to the club. Just uh, Phil Harrington spoke to the club in January, and during his presentation, he showed his analysis of, of the projected weather forecast. But making the point that Alan just made about you know you get weather, not climate, and uh, I know in, in our experience in 2017, we had perfectly clear skies on the northeast side of Nashville. My wife's cousin on the southwest side of Nashville was clouded out, 30 miles away. Mm -hmm. so even though you have this climatological weather that says what the probability of clouds are, you, you have local weather. True, true. Well, we, uh, uh, a couple of friends and myself went to, uh, spent the night uh, before the eclipse in 2017 in Knoxville, and we made the decision uh, whether to go west or east uh, from Knoxville. We wound up going to the Smoky Mountains uh, actually, we went to a, a place called Chatuga Bell Farms, which opened up their entire farm area to uh, Eclipse viewers, and and we had really wonderful luck. It was a it was an experience of a lifetime. I'm hoping I can do something like that again in 2024. On mute. Clearly, for a project like this, you need coverage throughout, and. Um... You can't just concentrate where it's slightly more likely to be clear. You want mm. you want to get uh, systematic coverage, and then, as you point out, everybody gets to share in the success, um, even though not everybody may get the best shot of the of the eclipse. Which is oh yeah, go about it. Yeah, everyone, all of our volunteers were were co-authors on the paper. You know, we had some people who left the filters on during the eclipse, you know, typical mistakes, um, but they, they're co-authors of the paper. So, um, yeah. And yeah, uh, you know, ironically, what you would, what we'd want to do is to put more telescopes where it's forecast to be cloudier, right? Because right. you need better density there. Um, we didn't quite do that in 17. I'm not sure that we'll have a chance to do it in 24, but and that's the other thing about having local experts. I mean, I don't know anything about the weather in Eastern Canada, um, which side of the islands to observe from or where the local weather is best. So um, identifying people who are local experts and empowering them to determine the site locations is is the way to go there. Right. I, I can just speak for myself that uh, it would be a lot more convenient for me to go to the northeast than it would be to go down to the southwest 
So uh, it would be a consideration. What, do you, uh, in order to take part in your project, uh, do you require that everybody use the same equipment that you're specifying? Yes. Okay. Right. right. So uh, again, we can um, purchase 60 sets, uh, well, 40 for general use, or if you happen to know a Girl Scout troop, for instance, and you want to be in charge of uh, a group of or young women in STEM, um, there are other options for funding there. Um, but yeah, so there are two two routes. You can either purchase the equipment yourself or you can uh, join our group and, uh, and uh, say that you want to get uh, a, an equipment package. Um, in that case, we're going to prioritize people who work with high school groups or um, university groups um, to get uh, a lot of students involved and excited. But yeah, the um, the uh, you know the difficulty of aligning coronal structures uh, really hit home about August twenty second in two thousand seventeen <laughs> for me. So using different telescopes would. I, I don't have the ability to, to figure that out. I see. Yes. Okay. Um, well, I'm very interested in in your in at least understanding what your project is and seeing if it makes sense for me. And I, I'd like to look look at the website and at your website and and learn a little bit more because I tuned in about halfway into your talk, so I didn't see the whole thing. But uh, uh, I appreciate what you're doing. I think it's it's fascinating. Well, Robert, it's it's recorded, so you'll be able to catch up on the first half. Great, great, thanks. I'm gonna mute myself now, because I think you're all more experienced and interesting than I am, so interesting than I am. So as far as uh, astronomy capability, uh, thank you. And I think I think you'll find that um, Matt's presentation tonight will give you more information than the website has so far. Is that true, Matt? I just uh, on on the uh, yeah. Deb initiative site, it seems to be mainly the the big picture right now, right? But more of the technical details in this in this uh, slide package. We're about to update that with results from Australia and also the equipment package, uh, the details about the equipment, um, and then at the end of the summer, we'll have another update where we'll have the sites located. So you, even if you're not part of the um, part of the project, uh, a map of the locations of the sites might give you ideas about where to go um, based on, you know, local experts. And we can, this group can try to stay in, uh, in contact with you about uh, whether anybody wants to pick up on it. I, I guess, Dan, are you committed to, are you going to be doing it already? So. Yeah, I, I will be, uh, I'll be near San Antonio for the annular and I'll be uh, outside of Dallas for the uh, total. Okay, so um, it will be our POC for uh, for keeping contact with the project and seeing if anybody else from the club wants to join in. Matt, could I ask a clarification, uh, Rich Berger? Yes. Um, I wasn't quite sure about what you were saying with respect to bulk purchases of equipment. If a member of this club is interested in obtaining the equipment, you mentioned that they could buy it on their own. You also mentioned that they could become part of your bulk purchase, but then it sounded like that was it was uncertain as to whether you would be able to incorporate them into your bulk purchase because you had a limit. Could you oh. elaborate on that a bit, please? Oh, so there's no limit currently. Um, and the first person who um, wants to be part of that bulk purchase is now going through the steps. So um, he's serving as a pathfinder for everybody else. Uh, we think it'll work out well. And so, you know, when we order um, 60 ASCARs telescopes, um, we'll be getting a discount. And I don't think there's a limit on how many people can join in, but the mechanics of how to do that are still a little uncertain. That'll be more clear in the next uh, two or three weeks. What would you advise uh, someone who's interested in doing that uh, with respect to keeping track of how you develop the method for participating with you. Yeah, so so send either an email to me at mattpen2015 at gmail, or um, we've got a general email site, uh, email address on our website. 
and just uh, you know put put it in writing that you're interested in in joining the the group purchase. Um, like I said, we're I'm keeping track of the people who are volunteering and people who are like yourself might be uh, joining our purchase. Um, and that's our main focus from now until uh, the end of August. Just getting that figured out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Matt, is the, is the software available already? Or, oh. And I'm not sure if they can, if you can do any practicing with it, but has that stabilized for this year, for 2020? Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> the capture software, um, we're just going to use SharpCap. So we've done, um, I've done tests on Nina, Fire Capture, Astro DMX, um, SharpCap, and I think another package. Um, looking for speed uh, of doing an HDR. So we're taking a, a four millisecond, a 40 millisecond, 400 and a four second. That's our plan right now, four exposures with different lengths. And we want to minimize that cycle time. So SharpCap was significantly faster than any of the other packages, faster than Fire Capture. I was surprised. So what we've got is a, a script in SharpCap. And for that, you need a SharpCap Pro license. But uh, Robin, who's the, the keeper of SharpCap, has agreed to give us a bulk uh, discount on that. So um, we'll be distributing those SharpCap licenses to people on the project um, for some. I mean, I think the full price is fifteen dollars a year. So, um, you know, you might want to get that yourself. I, I love it uh, my, myself anyway. Um, but so the, the capture uh, software is is done now. Um, to analyze the data, um, there's two steps. One is um, producing an HDR image uh, using the local computer, and there we're using um, a Python script. So. Maybe that's a little bit more involved, but the simplest Python interface I think is Anaconda, which lets you use a web browser to run your Python program. So we'll have some some way to uh, to have people download Anaconda onto their machines, um, and then so that's what people would do, presumably right after totality at their site. Then the final step is to take that HDR image and upload it to uh, a web server. Um, we might be using Google Drive, or we might be using another cloud-based server. We're not sure yet. We've done a lot of practice with the Google Drive um, system. Um, and so those those three steps in the software process are are fairly well understood. There's some details about the, the HDR Python script that we still need to sort. But for instance, if you have SharpCap Pro, I could, I could email the script to you tonight um, if you're interested in looking at it. Um, you're still on. There you go. Yeah. Um, and what what kind of a sequence are you adopting? Uh, go up and down through the time ranges continuously throughout the totality. Yeah. So step step through those. Um, we're looking at uh, something like five a five second mm -hmm. cycle time for those four exposures, mm -hmm. and we want to get those four exposures done before the moon moves more than a pixel relative to the sun. So five seconds is is that uh, limit. Um, and yeah, we'll just keep doing that through the two minutes or sorry, four minutes of totality. So 25 cycles basically per site. Um, and, and you obviously prefer to be on uh, very close to the center line. Not so not, not so tricky, not any trickiness of going for a limb edge, uh, southern or northern limb. Uh, those are probably, yeah, those are probably pretty spectacular views. I, I haven't seen it from off center line, but for this project, uh, we want to capture as as many images in the in near center line. If you look at the movie from seventeen, you can tell that people are north and south of the center line because the moon moves against the coronal structures um, from frame to frame. Sounds good. Okay, any any other questions for Matt? Are uh, the slides gonna be available? What's that, Andre? Uh, are the slides going to be available for download? If that's all right with you, Matt. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah, both both the video and the slide will be on the um, on the SIG drive, the, the special interest group drive. 
um, and I can I can repeat that URL. Well, it's it's bitly TSE 2024. TSE capitalized is our site with all the documentation, all the videos and the, and the slide packages. So yeah, that'll that'll all be easily available. And uh, and Matt, if there's anything else you want to contribute other than that, that won't be on the website, would be happy to post it also. Include that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, getting on. It's almost uh, it's almost an hour and a half now. I have a couple of more slides I want to show. Hopefully, uh, for, for wrapping wrapping things up for this month. Um, Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the status with uh, with our Eclipse viewing glasses. Um, just what the words say here. Dan and, and Woody worked with uh, MITRE, Jason Provodakis, who conveniently is a NOVAC member and president of MITRE, uh, is very much sensitive to getting glasses into the community with a little bit less kerfuddle than we had in 2017. Uh, last time, MITRE in particular was concerned that uh, some of the solar eclipse viewing glasses had bogus certifications. So we wanted to be early on to make sure we got good ones in the community. So that's moving forward. Uh, Deb Stover, who's a member, has volunteered to do the design. We'll come up with our, our own design that credits uh, Novak and MITRE and some other graphics. It has the dates of the uh, October eclipse this year and the April eclipse next year. Of course, the interest is that uh, both of those eclipses will be partial in this area. So uh, we want to get it out to uh, to our communities uh, in time for October. And I was just at uh, the Arlington Planetarium today and I was talking to the coordinator there and, and she's interested in participating also. Um, we will need some help getting getting these out um, we will literally have thousands of them to distribute and we have several kinds of distributions to be managed uh, certainly to our outreach events both public uh, outreach and to private groups um, there'll be a, a bunch that go to MITRE for their employees and their in their communities um, we'll um, we'll have some which we can probably share with other astronomy clubs in the area, uh, assuming that our volume is as, as large as we think it will be. Uh, and we'll also be giving it to members uh, based on a good suggestion from, from uh, Woody, um, where just members can distribute in their communities. The school groups say no, HOA groups, uh, scout groups that they're participating in, anything like that, so we'll get them out. But there are logistics challenges involved, and I would like to get some help to get that done. I'd like to get a lot of help to get that done so uh, it goes seamlessly as these events take place. We have, we have a way to get the distribution to the people who are seeing our communities um, at the point of contact. Um, we, we figure that we'll probably get the order in probably at the end of June. So uh, we don't get too far behind the curve as the demand goes up. Uh, certainly there'll be a lot of demand next spring, but we wanna get get them in hand well before the, the October event, which will probably have less publicity, but it'll be just as important to get them out. So mm -hmm. um, I think this group would be the appropriate place to expect some Novak members to, to help out. It shouldn't take a lot of time. It's just a lot of uh, the more hands we get to help with distribution and logistics, the easier it'll be for everybody. Um, we talked last month and um, uh, Rich Bergman uh, suggested again that we, we have some hands-on practice of setups beforehand, uh, not quite clear how long before next April in particular, we should do that. But uh, I'm thinking we may get going with it. Maybe in lieu of a July meeting, we can we can have a field trip someplace and have both the experienced people set up what they've done before and and 
newbies um, bring along what they think might work and we can have a, a discussion of what looks good and what doesn't look good. Uh, of course, before we do that, people have to have some idea of what they'll be putting together from the equipment they have already. Um, obviously, you may not have the equipment that you're going to buy for next April, but uh, whatever you think you have as far as tripods, tracking mounts, lenses, sensors, um, and I'm talking about astrophotography here, not so much visual observing, because uh, I think that's a little bit less critical. And people will be able to actually go through the motions and take some solar pictures. Hopefully we'll do it on a clear day, um, but um, go through the differences that we talked about last time between what most of us do at nighttime observing and, and the issues that come up trying to observe the sun. I think for that, uh, one of the main things in preparation that we'd also like to have done is have several people volunteer to download each of the orchestration programs, each of the scheduling programs that might be used and um, get their reports on ease of use and, and whether they work as intended between um, common cameras, which are typically either dedicated cameras or Canons or Nikons and, um, and computers, which would either be Macs or or Windows machines. Uh, so if there are people who are planning to get this software, and most of it is is either free or nearly free, that's not a big deal, but it's just an issue of getting the software now and getting some practice with it so you can do a show and tell at the, at the hands-on. And then, as I, as I said before, maybe we'll do this or do a version of it in lieu of a July meeting um, or alternatively, we could do it as an afternoon activity before one of our scheduled monthly events at either Sky Meadows or uh, Crockett. Uh, people have opinions about that, but when would be a good time to have the hands on? Just, just come off mute and tell me what you think. I think that a sunny day in July sounds awfully hot. Yeah, that's true. But it wouldn't be getting better. Uh, just bring enough beer. What's Andre? What that's Andre? Just bring enough beer. <laughs> bring enough beer? <laughs> I think one version of the side said, uh, bring your telescopes and your beer coolers, you know. Um, Well, I don't know what, I mean, the alternative would be to wait till the fall, but that's that's a long time. Well, All right. We uh, just did it a couple of hours before sunset uh, at one of the regular uh, Novak star parties. You know, it doesn't have to be midday. Right. Wouldn't be quite so hot at five o'clock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially with late sunsets. Um, yeah. We could practice even if even if the sun's at 20, 25 degrees. Yeah. That's probably good enough. Um, well, the people going to Texas, I, they have to get used to the heat. It's hot there in April. All right, we'll have some further consideration, but uh, I did want to talk, I guess, about the, the next sessions. And part of it is that the logical time for a July evening meeting would be July 4th, but which is one day past full moon. Um, but obviously we're not going to have it that day. Um, and um, it'd be hard to schedule some, as, as you get past full, it becomes more a time where people want to go out and observe. Or we don't want to conflict with people who want to go out and observe. Next month, I think we'd do it on Thursday, uh, June 1st even though um, that's a little bit before the, the meeting, so I wouldn't have a chance to get a reminder out at the meeting. But that's a little bit more full more than four weeks from today. So um, assuming that particular day is all right with George, I think um, 
we'll plan on doing that. And then we'll make a final decision about what to do in July at the June meeting. So I think that's all I had. Does uh, anybody else have any comments, questions, things they've learned that should uh, that they want to announce for the for the good of the group? Ellen, I just had one uh, gearhead question for Matt. I noticed that he picked the player one uh, camera. And player one, I think, has sort of just come on the map, and it's it's good for planetary and it's good for solar. But I thought for solar, what they had was the Apollo series, and I just wondered if Matt could talk very briefly about how they picked that camera. Yeah, the um, <clears throat> we were happy with the uh, the fourteen bits in this camera, um, so better dynamic range, and um, the. Uh, the pixel size matched uh, really well. So we had found that the IMX 178 was a good camera uh, from ZWO. And then that was discontinued <laughs> about a week after we decided to select it. <laughs> but uh, player one is using the chip now in their uh, in their Neptune M. So we're, we're pretty happy with it. It's got a, a good uh, well depth and 14 uh, bit resolution. Okay, thank you. So, so yeah, I'm not sure who's deciding which is solar and which is planetary over at player one, but uh, <laughs> I think they might have it backwards. Okay, thanks. Uh, Matt, uh, you, you mentioned using the, the Raton 12 filter. Uh, is there any ad advantage in going any narrower? Um, yeah, yeah, so then it, it uh, it's a battle between trying to get those exposures <clears throat> in a short period of time and the flux that gets in. Um, obviously, the, the narrower you go, the sharper your image is because you're less susceptible to chromatic aberration. Uh, but the wider um, you are, the shorter your exposures can be, and you know have a faster cadence that way. I was also I was also thinking about um, avoiding Rayleigh scattering and um, and getting more of the sun and less of the sky. Because I'm, I'm yeah. how blue the sky is during totality or the residual of blue. If I had a, a, a preference, actually, I'd go I'd go more blue to uh, to increase the um, resolving power of the telescope of a you know finite aperture telescope. Um, I think at, at totality the sky is so dark that there's not a lot of color um, issue. Okay. Uh, but again, as <clears throat> as you go more blue, the flux drops, and so you'll need to get longer exposures. So it, it's a battle and uh, and something, you know, in, in 17, we used the yellow number 12 and a UVIR blocker in, in combination. Um, but tests with the ASCAR, which has six elements, doesn't show any improvement with a UVIR blocker. So um, I think the correction there is, is good. And maybe just the yellow is gonna, it's gonna do it for us. Okay. Yeah, well, you had the chance to test, which is good. That's all right. Uh, well, nobody has anything else. It's uh, a little bit after nine. I appreciate people hanging in. Um, thanks everybody for attending. Thank you, Matt, for showing up and telling us the story. It's a very, very interesting project. Best wishes and not going crazy, trying to get people lined up. And we'll we'll be in contact too. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you.